Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 27th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storms on us Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. A couple days ago, Xavier talked about how zip bombs in malware can be used in order uh, to allow a malware to enter networks by essentially making sure the uncompressed file is large enough that anti-malware won't look at it. Of course, once you have the uncompressed file, you still have to deal with basically all the garbage data that's in the file after you uncompressed it. And DDA now has a little trick for you how you're able to remove that garbage data. In particular, if there is still a authentic code digital signature in the end that you would like to preserve. So what you end up with is the executable then a bunch of garbage, meaning nulls usually, basically empty data, and then the signature. So we would like to remove the nulls and just uh, move the signature back to the end of the executable. And the DDA walks you through some scripts and how to essentially uh, do this. And Horizon 3 AI, as promised, did yesterday release an exploit for CVE 2022-22972, the VMware authentication bypass vulnerability. And with that exploit, they also released a blog showing the root cause of the vulnerability, which actually is relatively simple. When you are logging in uh, to a system that uses uh, Workspace ONE or like uh, we realize is what uh, they used here at Horizon 3 AI, your browser is sending a request to an authentication endpoint. The trick here is that, of course, with that request, you're also sending a host header, which typically, of course, would be the host name of that endpoint. But if you are altering the host header and inserting a different host name here, then the authentication server will actually connect back to that host name and basically let that host name do the authentication. As long as a 200 status is being returned, then you are logged in. The exploit as a result sort of has these two parts. Uh, first of all, to send the request with the right data to the authentication endpoint and then a little web server that will just respond to the request that's coming back and authenticate the user. So in other words, don't patch now, patch yesterday or last week. If you're patching now, it may already be too late. And researchers at Eclipsium did take a closer look at Quanta servers, in particular the Quanta Crit D52B rack mount server, but likely what they found is true for other models as well. The problem here is that these servers are vulnerable to a relatively old a BMC vulnerability. The vulnerability CVE 2019-6260 does essentially allow taking over this BMC, which of course then takes over the server and allows a running arbitrary code on the server, no matter what operating system or what else you have running on the system. And sadly, Quanta has not yet released an update for this vulnerability. So if you're using any of these servers, uh, watch out for an update from Quanta. And if you're running Trend Micro Endpoint on Windows 11 or Windows Server 2022 and you're really enterprising and installed the preview patch that was released on May 24th, be aware that this patch may interfere with uh, the Trend Micro driver that's responsible for some of the more advanced features like ransomware protection. Well, it's Friday again, so we do have a sans.edu student with us, actually a graduate of the program. Uh, Nate, uh, you finished a couple of years ago, or could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Nate Street. I am a SIM product manager at J.P. Morgan Chase. I've been with the firm for about six years now. Um, prior to joining, I was a, a SOC manager. I was based down in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, my background is you know, primarily instant response and um yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been very interested in SIM technology for the last uh, decade. The views expressed here are my own and do not represent those of my employer, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. We do not currently use this proof of concept method within the firm. Of course, the 
project we are going to talk about here is based on your Sansod EDU research that you did uh, two or three years ago, I think it was. But the, the reason we sort of pick up on this is because you actually got a patent awarded on it, right? Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what the research was about that sort of led to this uh, patent? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the research paper was focused on uh, determining the value of a log and, uh, you know, pr- primarily for the purposes of incident response. Anyone who's been in a SOC environment and seen all the data that's being sent to the SIM, uh, there's usually a lot of data there that, that isn't relevant. It's not actual. Uh, a lot of times there's a disconnect between, you know, what uh, some engineers might think is v- relevant for an analyst to see and what an analyst actually needs in order to perform incident response. And so the proof of concept tool was really focused on arriving at a quantitative value for uh, each log that you send to the SIM. Now, there are a couple frameworks like this that people have been using in the past to sort of figure out, you know, what logs to use, like coverage of the attack uh, net uh, framework and a uh, couple sort of online guides, more or less informal, in you know what to enable in uh, in in your logging platforms. When it comes to the value of a log that you're adding, uh, what are some of the characteristics that you're looking for uh, with uh, your system? I uh, really use two variables to define um, what I call the log quality index, which. Uh, there, that is uh, criticality and value. So criticality looks at the entire log and really looks at it from the perspective of, okay, well, if I were to remove this log from the environment, would there be a material gap um, to the analysts? Uh, would they be able to detect that type of activity? Uh, and so if you think about it from you know, looking at it in a quadrant and each quadrant was assigned one, two, three, four, uh, I really want you know my urgent or my high priority logs to be in that upper quadrant. Now, what tends to happen is that you know in in reality, uh, you know log data is sent to the SEM. Sometimes it's for different purposes. Sometimes it's to meet audit requirements that um, that need to be met, but they don't actually provide actionable material. So not everything usually sits in that upper quadrant. Then I have uh, the value. Uh, and you can think of the value as, you know, if you assign the value of a, a zero or it's a variable. And I ask, you know, really questions, uh, broadly speaking, that align with who, what, when, where. Um, things that allow you to determine what type of activity occurred, uh, where did it happen, who performed the action. Uh, and there, and when you really look into, you know, what makes a log valuable, it has certain criteria that an analyst would be able to actually, you know, uh, perform action on, on that data. And so, you know, a lot of times you'll have logs that don't have any sort of really actual uh, data. And so the, really the goal behind the proof of concept was to determine uh, which logs are valuable and which ones are not. Of course, there's also a cost in importing too many logs in your sim, like you know, it slows down and such. Mm-hmm. If you have the choice between two logs that sort of uh, basically describe a very similar activity, and that often happens, mm-hmm. how do you select which one of those logs you're going to pick? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, when you're in a SOC, uh, and I noticed this when I was an uh, analyst, um, you get really familiar with the data and the logs that are generated from that device. Sometimes some logs, uh, the data actually ages pretty quickly, especially if it has, uh, you know, cached um, data. Uh, a lot of times, like network traffic, you might be, you know, looking for a certain source IP. But if you look at, you know, some switches might have cache data that hasn't been updated. So the fidelity of that data within the actual data source is is really key. And so, you know, one thing that I learned is that, okay, well, um, I can trust this particular data um, for whatever reason. It, it's, uh, it, it tends to be more relevant. Um, and so if you had two sources of logs, uh you'd probably need to determine whether, uh, you know, which one was more than likely able to, to provide that, that more accurate uh, description of the environment. Um, now, the tool doesn't actually, you, you would need to probably look at that data and, and really talk to the analyst to make that, that decision. You're paper outlined like these different questions you're asking, sort of a rubric in how you're creating uh, those logs to, and then you assign like points, very much like we sort of create our research papers too, kind Mm -hmm. of. Can you mention like a couple questions that you're basically asking to figure out, you know, whether or not a log Mm -hmm. is valuable? I really made an effort when coming up with this list to make sure that they were very simple 
and that they were focused on a single element so that you don't get these really qualitative questions that are multifaceted. So they, they actually are, are pretty uh, straightforward. Um, are the events timestamped? Um, is there a source IP? Is there a destination IP? Uh, is there a source port? Is there a destination port? Uh, you know, to your point uh, in, the, in the last question, is the confidence level and the accuracy of the event high? Right. And so if I were to see this, is this actually representative of the activity? Uh, does the format of the log negative, excuse me, negatively impact the ability to understand when the action occurred? And that would be a, a, a decrease in value. Um, let's see, what are some, some ones? Does another application device on the network capture similar information? I also have you know, a few questions that look at, OK, well, does this log source cover all the platforms? Um, you know, is it is it uh, on Windows, Linux, and Mac? Um, does it contain PII information? Um, has the log been used in an incident within the last two or three years? And and some of these things, if you if you kind of apply some sort of governance um, around your logs and reevaluate them, then you know they you know log can can really change its value throughout time. You might get you might introduce a new application or device that provides similar data or better data. And uh, it's really to to provide the value in relationship to other laws that you have in the environment as well. Now, the PII is an interesting aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would deduct uh, or increase the value would, of the log. That would increase uh, okay. with the log source. Yeah, yeah whether yeah, the data yeah. PII left the environment exfiltration. Yeah. Okay, so it's in exfiltration of the. So it's not that the log itself mm -hmm. includes PII, but it's related to PII. That's right. Uh, so what it's about? Yeah, great. Uh, what what scores do you end up with there usually? So, so, you know, ideally, you know, you would take this and apply the, the, the tool across all your logs. So, um, you know, ideally, it, they would really land in that upper quadrant one uh, or two. And then if it lands in three or four, you really could can, can make the, these business decisions. Do I really need to send this data to the SOC? Maybe I could send that data to, uh, you know, another uh, data lake or something that like an S3 bucket that I can search against. Uh, the the log would be available just if the analyst really needed that data, but it's not something that you really want to you know waste uh, hardware and performance to ingest into the SOC. Um, but then you know for value, uh, you know for the purposes of my research, um, you know the I, I calculated a minimum and a maximum value using the, the log quality value index. So uh, the the minimum value would be like uh, quadrant four uh, criticality four uh, negative seven. So it basically had no positive characteristics and all negative. The at the high end of the scale would be you know criticality of one and a value of forty one, and so you know based on that you can you know look at what we call like kind of guardrails and say okay well if the value is between zero and ten maybe it's not really that that great, but if it's ten or twenty then okay that's data that we can use it's valuable, um, and so during the in the research paper. Um, we, we took, you know, the Verizon data breach, uh, you know, uh, several studies from the Verizon data breach report, aligned it with the tools that would hopefully detect that data. And there was a positive correlation between the tools uh, and the data that uh, the log data that came in through those tools and what the, the proof of concept said was valuable to the incident responders. And can you give us an example like for a log that has a very low score and one that has a very high score? I, I need to pull up that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, no, that's great. Um, I think one thing that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, file integrity monitoring um, was a was a tool that when I ran it through, you know, my set of questions, um, it was C two and V six, which isn't like a great score. Um, you know, in practice, file integrity monitoring it, it logs a lot of data, but it wasn't really you know items that I think you should really be sending to the SEM. Some of the best sources of data using the, the study, uh, the, the data breach studies, um, Cisco IOS. So I had that as, as um, a very positive. So that was a C1 uh, V21. So that's very high. That's used to detect web server connections to known you know, source IPs uh, or known suspicious IPs. Um, let's see. HIDS was another uh, pretty good source. So, so using the data... <clears throat> In my uh, for the tools, it was C1 V11, so it was still in that upper quadrant. It wasn't fantastic, um, but the one that was very high was actually the WAF. Uh, so we have a Sophos WAF, and so that had a criticality of one and value of twenty nine using my uh, evaluation criteria. 
Great, and I'll definitely add a link uh, to the paper in the show notes. Congratulations uh, for your patent, and okay, uh, you. any final words? Anything you're working on right now? Oh, yeah, uh, you know, honest. Well, thank you for you know inviting me on the show. Um, I, I really encourage people, you know, if they take a look at the paper, to to email me. Uh, my email address is natestreet at gmail com. If you have any ideas. Um, I, I love talking about that. Um, SANS was, you know, Technology Institute was a great experience. I'm very happy that I, I attended it uh, for my under, for my graduate uh, program. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Tuesday. Monday, there will be no podcast because of Memorial Day.